on this job as well, so I'll probably mess it up. But it's good to have you with us, and it's good to see the sun shining this morning. It's a pleasure to welcome to the pulpit Mr. Daniel Ballantyne. It's his first time here. I was telling him about a couple of his colleagues here through the vacancy. We had Ryan and we had John. So no pressure this morning, for they were excellent. Daniel, it's good to have your wife with, it, with you here this morning as well. And it's good to see you with us. A couple of announcements, folks. Do remember the midweek as it continues on Wednesday night. For everyone, we're all together on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. And mothers and toddlers, so it's a sort of an exploratory meeting just to see who's interested on Thursday week, 8 o'clock, Suzanne. Is that right? Right. So Thursday week, 8 o'clock, if you're interested in a mothers and toddlers group, meet in the hall, I presume, Thursday week, or better still ask Suzanne, and she'll give you the right information about it. But these, I believe, oh, I, I do remember the evening service, nearly forgot that. These, I believe, are all the announcements. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Glen Weary with you. Um, as I said, my name's Daniel. I'm married to the wonderful Kate. Uh, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be up here with you all. Uh, thank you to Trevor as well for uh, inviting me along. Um, he's put a lot of faith in me. I don't know whether it's misguided or misplaced, but he'll tell you in an hour's time. Folks, we're here to worship the Lord, and it's a great day to worship the Lord. Let's hear us Let's hear him call us to worship from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. This morning we're thinking about the parable of the sower from Matthew 13. And we're thinking about how God's kingdom grows. And as we acknowledge that God has a kingdom, we recognize that he is king. He's king over all creation. But he's also king over us, his people. And he's worthy of our worship and our praise. And that's what we're going to start by doing. We're going to stand to sing uh, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Why not stand together? And join with us as we praise.
as we've sung praise to God, let's come before him as we pray to him. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge this morning that you are worthy of all praise and all honor, for you are the great God, the great King over the whole earth, who rules over us in kindness, wisdom, in justice, and with great mercy. Thank you for your mercy to us on this day, in giving us life and breath and everything. And above all, we thank you that You've made a kingdom for yourself. You've made a people for your own possession. And thank you that through the work of Jesus, your son, you've brought us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light by your sheer goodness and grace. But Father, in the light of your goodness and grace, we come humbly before you this morning, acknowledging that we have loved darkness instead of light. We confess our unworthiness before you, and we confess our failures as well. Father, we have grieved your spirit. Even today, we may not have resisted, your, or resisted temptations as your people should. Father, forgive us for not giving you the loyalty which you deserve. Forgive us for we do not deserve to be counted among your kingdom citizens. Forgive us for the ways in which we show that we don't deserve your grace and your kindness. So humbly this morning, we ask that you would forgive us. But we thank you above all for your son, Jesus, through whose perfect life, death and resurrection, we're reconciled to you and brought into your kingdom by faith. We give thanks to you um, with the writer of the Psalms who says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Father, we ask this morning and every day as we leave this place, that you would strengthen us by your spirit so that we might worship you in this place and worship you as we leave this place. And we pray that you would cause um, us to bear fruit in our lives, and might that be fruit that is glorifying to you and pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we we're thinking this morning about the parable of the sower found in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read that together. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, please turn to Matthew 13. And we'll be starting at verse 1. So, Matthew chapter 13, and starting at verse 1. This is God's word. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so they got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, 
even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Amen. And we thank the Lord for his word. Now, boys and girls, it's good to see you here this morning. Uh, if you want to come and join me at the front, we'll have a quick chat before uh, you head out to Faith Kid in Action later on. Have we got this right? Kind of. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? Great. Before I lose that, I'm going to put that in my back pocket. Boys and girls, it's really good to see you this morning. How are you doing? Good. There's a few shy smiles. That's good. It's good that you're here at church. And it's good that you're here worshiping the Lord with younger folks, older folks as well. It's super to be here. My name's Daniel. And if we haven't met before, I'm Daniel. I'm married to Kate. And we're just up here for the day, but it's a pleasure to be with you. Boys and girls, I brought something with me, and I was trying to hide it from you on the way in, because I didn't want to ruin the surprise. I brought with me a, a painting from a very special friend of Kate and ours, and you know what it is. Well, maybe I'll show it, and then you can tell me if you, if you were right, if that makes sense. So, what I have here. Anyone know what this is a painting of? Did you know? What, what, did you, what did you think it was? It was a tree, spot on. This is a painting of a tree, and it's a very lovely painting that we got from a friend. Boys and girls, anyone interested in gardening? Anyone like going out in the garden, helping mum and dad or granny and granda? You do? You, you like playing football in the garden. I know some of these guys love playing football in the garden too, which might wreck the plants, won't it? But does any of you guys like actually helping to plant? Some of the plants or trees in your garden? Yeah? What kind, of, what kind of things do you plant in your garden? Not sure? Not sure. That's okay. We plant all kinds of things, don't we? Here's another question. What do you need to plant a tree in your garden? What are some of the things you might need? Any ideas? Yeah. A seed? Yes, absolutely. You need seed. Anything else? Yeah. Water? So seed, water, soil, absolutely. We've got budding gardeners here in Glenweir. It's great. And then there's something else you need. Yeah, do you know? Do you know? A watering can, absolutely. Yep, you need to get water in. Yeah. 
sunlight. That's the one. Good work, guys. Those are pretty much all you need uh, to grow a, a plant or a tree, just like this. Hold on a moment. I have another question. What do you think is the most important of all of those things? Any idea what of the sunlight, the seeds, the water, the soil, which is the most important? The water? Yeah, it's really important. Any other guesses, though? Yeah, go for it. The seed, absolutely. Water's really important. Sunlight's really important. Soil's really important. But I'm sure I might get into debate after church here on the way out. I think seed is the most important thing. If you don't have a seed, what are you growing? You could plant the seed and not have water or sunlight or soil, and it could probably grow in some ways, but not really. But you'll still have a seed. You'll still have a plant in very, very miniature form. The seed is the most important thing. If you want to grow a big tree. Boys and girls, in our reading there, Jesus was telling people a story about a sower who went out to sow seed. And what he was saying in that was that that's how God grows people. That's how God grows his church. Just church like here in Glen Weary. He grows it by sowing seed. And he says the seed is God's word, the Bible. What you hear, both here in church, what you hear in BBGB or Faith Connection, or maybe you hear it at home, that's God's way of growing people up to love and trust Jesus even more. That's God's method. And that's how he does it. It's really, really cool. It doesn't require us to be super smart or super talented at anything. God promises to grow us, to love and trust Jesus, to follow him as king through his word, through his seed. Boys and girls, you guys can um, really, really make use of that because in Glen Weary, you hear the Bible read and preached every Sunday morning when you come here. Uh, you hear it at Faith Connection. You'll hear it at other things through the week. Maybe at home, mommy or daddy or granny or grand or whoever's at home maybe reads the Bible with you, maybe prays with you. What we can do is we can open our ears and really listen intently to the Bible. And God promises to help us grow, to love and trust his son, Jesus, more. God sows his seed, and that's what makes us grow. God's word does God's work and helps us grow just like a tree. Let me pray for you, boys and girls, before you head back to your mum and dads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that in it we see who you are, who we are in light of who you are, and what you've done for us in Jesus. Father, thank you that you promised to grow your people through your word. Father, help us, help boys and girls here, help us as older people as well to listen to your word whenever it's read and explained. And we pray that you would help us grow into strong, spiritual men and women who love and trust Jesus evermore each day. Thank you for the gift of your word. And we pray you'd help us listen as this service goes on and as faith connection happens later. In Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, you head back to mom and dad's just at the moment. And we're going to sing, uh, thank you, Jesus. Um, what better way to respond uh, to hearing God's word than saying thank you and thank you to Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. Let's stand together and sing.
this point, the offering will be collected, and at this point, kids can leave for faith, kid, and action. Let's uh, come together in prayer as we pray for others. Uh, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you in the name of our Savior, friend, and King Jesus. Thank you that through him we know you hear our prayers. You hear our requests. Father, we also thank you that your word reminds us that you are the great shepherd the true shepherd over your people. Thank you, you care for us, that you nourish us with your word, but also that you protect us fiercely against our own hearts and our own enemies. Father, in that light, we give thanks to you for your people here in Glen Weary. And we pray for those among us, known to us this morning, who suffer physically, emotionally, and mentally. Father, might they hear your word and find rest in Christ, the one who tells us to come to him and find rest for our souls. Father, we pray also for those known to us who face uh, difficult treatment at the moment, who await diagnoses, and who even live with debilitating illness and conditions. Father, we pray that you would comfort them. We pray for those who treat them and care for them, that you would grant them wisdom, and for those who suffer this morning who trust in Christ, might they be reminded and strengthened by the promise that though the outer body may feel weak and wasting away, that you're able to renew their inner strength daily. We pray that their trust might be in Christ and it might be even more sure, even though they feel weak. Father, we thank you for the faithful witness of your people here in Glen Weary, not only in this day, but in days gone past. And we ask that you would encourage them, that you would remind them of your grace, remind us of your love towards us in Jesus. We pray you would equip all of us to make him known in this community, in our workplaces, in our schools and colleges, and anywhere we have contact with people. Father, as we look outside uh, this church and our immediate vicinity, we pray for our world. And we pray for each of us that we would go and proclaim Christ in the world. Father, we pray for our nation in particular at this time. As we reflect on the recent anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, we do give you thanks for a relative peace in this land. Father, we pray that you would comfort those who, when reminded this week of the conflict and all that came with it, we pray that you would comfort those who grieve, whose hearts are heavy this week. Father, as we look ahead to upcoming council elections, we ask for your wisdom um, as we exercise our right to vote. We thank you for the freedom to do so. But we above all ask that you would raise up godly leaders who would rule wisely for the good of all and for the glory of your name. Father, we pray in particular as we look beyond our own nation to the nation of Sudan this morning. And we ask for your sovereign hand to intervene there. That you would bring an end to armed conflict and struggle for power. 
In particular, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Sudan whose future and lives are looking very bleak. Father, we acknowledge that they already face persecution for confessing and proclaiming the name of Jesus. Father, we pray you'd give them strength not to lose heart under pressure. And might there be much fruit, even in the midst of difficulty and trial. Might there be many who come to save in faith in Christ. Father, we thank you that you're able to do so. And that your word is powerful to do that work. Father, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, before we come to consider God's word, let's uh, sing together uh, what love my God would bring you down to earth. Let's pray or sing together.
Can I just say a word of thanks to those who've led us in song and praise this morning. It's greatly appreciated and it's wonderful to hear God's people sing. It's always an encouragement to our hearts. Recently, um, don't know if you guys are the same, you maybe get a book at Christmas time. Uh, maybe it's at the bottom of your stocking or whatever. Uh, you get a random book and it sits on the bedside table for a while. And you maybe intend to read it, uh, but maybe you never get around to it. Uh, that book for me this year was uh, a book, uh, a, I suppose it was a, an autobiography by a guy called Phil Knight. Uh, Phil Knight is the founder of uh, the shoe and sports company Nike, if you've ever heard of Nike before. Uh, the story was absolutely fascinating. Uh, this worldwide, instantly recognizable company and logo that we all know um, actually started very, very small. Although it's a huge corporation now with huge headquarters in America, dedicated factories across the world who produce Nike goods and Nike goods only, it actually started out of Phil Knight's boot of his car. He used to sell shoes he bought from Japan. He didn't make his own shoes. He bought them in from Japan, sold them from the boot of his car in the 1960s, and from there it grew. But it was very, very humble beginnings. It's truly an incredible story of growth. And that growth came through good timing, and he admits that. It came through much creativity. It came through intelligence. He was a very intelligent man. He saw a niche in the market, and he went for it. But there's also persistence and determination, because it definitely wasn't easy. They didn't make profit for years. It's an amazing and fascinating story of growth. In our reading today, we find Jesus uh, teaching people in Galilee, and he speaks to them a parable about growth. And it's not growth of a business, of course. It is about the growth of the kingdom of God. And it's the first of many parables, which I'm sure many of you have heard um, over the years, about the kingdom. What do we mean by the kingdom of God, though? Why is he speaking of the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God can simply be described as God's people, those who trust in the king living in God's place, not an earthly place, but a heavenly one, who live under God's rule. And Jesus uses parables to talk about the kingdom often, and they're quite recognizable for us. The parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the weeds come to mind. But why does he speak in parables? Why do this? Is it just so that we can understand them easier? Well, in some ways, yes, but in other ways, no. That's why we read verses 10 to 17 in between the parable and its explanation because it's important for us to hear there's at least two reasons why jesus uses a parable like this and it's really relevant for us to hear this this morning firstly parables harden some and soften others jesus speaks of its effect it hardens those who do not have ears to hear and it softens those who do have ears to hear secondly parables also show whether we get the message. They show whether we get the gospel, if you want to put it that way. Do we get the message of the kingdom? That's what he talks about in verse 13, 17. That's why he quotes Isaiah. It's to show whether his listeners, who are hearing this parable and us, whether our ears, eyes, and minds are closed, shut, stopped, and whether our hearts are hard. They're like tests. Do we get this or do we not? Do we truly hear? Do we truly see? Do we truly understand? Let's ask the Lord now before we dive into the parable. To ask, Let's ask him for understanding. That's probably the best way to start. So join with me as we pray for the Lord's light and help to understand his word. Heavenly Father, we ask you humbly today that through the reading and the preaching of your word, that you would be pleased to call us out of our sin to Jesus, to give light to our minds that we would spiritually and savingly understand your word, to take away our hard hearts and make them soft, teachable, and moldable, to change and renew our wills and desires so that by your power we would seek what is pleasing obedient and good to you 
And we ask that you would be pleased to draw us to rest on Jesus even more as we hear and see him in his word. For it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. So parables, they're important. They show whether we understand the gospel, the message of the kingdom. And either side of Jesus' explanation of why he uses parables is, of course, the parable of the sower. The parable about the kingdom of God and primarily how the kingdom of God grows. How is it that God, the sower, makes it grow? So that's what we're going to consider this morning. Firstly, we're going to consider God's method. And his method is the word of God causes the growth of the kingdom. He does it by his word. The parable is all about the sower, uh, sometimes called the parable of the soils. Um, but it ultimately revolves around a sower going out to sow his seed. The sower in verse 3, of course, is God. He sows his seed throughout history. And that seed is identified as the message or word of the kingdom, the gospel, his word. And God sows his seed throughout history. We know that. He does that through the apostles or the disciples who are listening to this. Then faithful ministers, elders, pastors, normal believers, just like us, all throughout history. The fact that the sower sows his seed is of immense comfort to us. Because it reminds us that God, the almighty, powerful, ever-loving one, does this work. And he continues to do his work. He uses us, yes, of course. But his sowing does not return to him empty. And his sowing goes on. There's no implication here that God has ceased to do this work. God continues to sow his word. And that's immense comfort to us this morning. As I said, the seed he sows is the word of the kingdom. The message primarily about the king of the kingdom, who is Jesus. It's the message of the kingdom. It is good news. It's called the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 4, earlier when Jesus speaks. Jesus went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel good news of the kings coming to live in this world, to die on a cross, to rise again. And how it must be responded to by trust, by faith, by turning to him. And it's this method that God uses. He, his method is sowing this gospel. He proclaiming this gospel, you could say. That's what the, the old uh, Westminster divines in the 17th century used to say, or they wrote, that faith comes about where we're enabled to believe to the saving of our souls. And it comes about ordinarily through the ministry of the word. In other words, through the speaking of the word, the proclamation of the word. It's the speaking of this good news that God uses to build his kingdom, to bring people in. It's a tried and tested method. In other words, if we want to see our churches grow, if we want to see ourselves individually as Christians, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you want to grow in the faith, it can never be a part of, or it is not ordinarily apart from the word of God. His method is like a well-worn path of a mountain. Um, when we're coming over the hill, coming here this morning, I think we saw Slamish in the, somewhere in the distance. I wasn't quite sure whether it was Slamish or not, but it's close by to you here. Um, Slamish has its own well-worn paths that you'd be probably a bit foolish to go off and go your own way, especially if it's foggy, there's not much visibility. We need tried and tested paths to keep us on the right track, to keep us going to our destination. And God's method of sowing his seed, God's method of the proclamation of his word to grow his kingdom is that tried and tested method. It's always to be trusted. And it is a good thing. His people grow and flourish his way and ultimately not ours. And that has got to be a core conviction personally but also as a church and churches across this land. And there are plenty of things that we'll do and you do in church life that you're free to wisely choose how to do, to organize, uh, because scripture is silent. And of course, we shouldn't be wedded to 
human tradition that's unwise or unhelpful, but this we are not free from. We are not free to change this core practice and conviction, and that is the proclamation of God's word, the proclamation of the gospel. Methods, styles, and forms will change, and they have changed over the years. I'm sure many of you have seen that in your own lifetime. And we might even be tempted to think to change our methods um, and even neglect this core conviction because we're not sure that people care anymore or we don't think it works. Can I encourage you? Look at this parable again. How does God grow his kingdom? And it's by the proclamation of his word. It's what Paul says in Romans 1, 16, 17, isn't it? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. It's what he uses. In other words, God's word does God's work. He uses us, yes, but it's his word that does his work. And we can trust him. It's the only reason any of us ever came to believe in the first place. So the kingdom grows as God's word goes out and is proclaimed. That's God's growth method. Yet, as you probably hear me saying that, or you hear this parable, you think, but that doesn't happen all the time, does it? People hear preaching all the time. People read stuff all the time, and they never, they don't seem to care. Well, you're right. We sow the word. We ask the Lord that it would grow, and there just seems to be nothing sometimes. We despair over our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors who don't care for Jesus, who don't realize the danger they're in when they reject him. But Jesus acknowledges that in this parable. He acknowledges the reality that not only um, of God's method, but the fact that this word of the kingdom will also be rejected. And we see that in a number of ways, don't we? That's familiar to us if we've heard this parable before. Um, the seed is rejected and thus the sower is rejected. It's not only rejected, but it also doesn't produce fruit that it's meant to. We see that in verse 4. There's the seed that falls on the path. The word doesn't even cross the mind of the listener. It's as if the lights are on, but no one's home, spiritually speaking. And the evil one takes it away. It's merely heard, maybe in one ear and out the other. In verse 5, there's the seed that falls on rocky ground. You know, on the surface, the word is received with joy, is what we read. But it becomes evident when life, difficulty, and trial comes along that there's no root. There's no planting has happened. It's not as if this person or this listener was in the kingdom and is now no longer. There's no root. There's nothing there to begin with. Let me tell you about a friend from school who um, reminds me of this kind of person. When we were in Upper Sixth in school in Lisburn, um, he made a profession of faith at a school SU weekend. It looked like the sower's word had taken root. And we were overjoyed. It was great. Fast forward, I don't know how many years that is now. He no longer professes faith. He rejects the gospel. You see, there seemed to be a short period of time where there seemed to be saving faith. But it sadly proved not to be the case. And it didn't take long for that to change. Immediately it sprang up with joy, but also as quickly it seemed to be absent. I'm sure, man, if you can think of someone in your own life who you've even wept over, who this happened to as well. Perhaps the seed that falls on the rocky ground, perhaps the rocky ground is like someone who temporarily accepts maybe the good things about the gospel. The things that we like to tell people that, oh, there's forgiveness of sin. There is love from God. There's mercy. There's this coming as you are, not having to spruce yourself up. Amen. All things we must proclaim, but sometimes we just like those things and not the things that cost us, the cost of trusting in Jesus, the necessary change that comes from being renewed and regenerated by the Spirit of God. And that person falls, or as one commentator puts it, they're literally tripped up. It's a total collapse because there was no root. And then finally, there's the thorny ground in verse 7. 
like the other two, it doesn't appear to have rooted. But notice that it's the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of, of wealth that choke and kill any kind of planting, any kind of fruit. Notice the focus on money, on its deceitfulness, how money promises much but delivers little satisfaction and it chokes the word from us. It's very violent imagery, isn't it? It is choking the word from planting in us. It takes our eyes off Jesus Christ, the one to whom we must run to in times of worry. It takes our eyes off him and puts them onto the worries themselves. Why does this happen? Why does the kingdom, or the word of the kingdom, why is it rejected? Remember what Jesus said about the purpose of parables. They show whether we understand the gospel or not, but it also reveals the hardness of our hearts. And that is our natural state. We know this from the rest of scripture. In our nature, we naturally reject God. We reject as our hearts are calloused in verse 14. They're dead, rock hard. Always hearing, but never understanding truly. I wonder if you've ever picked up a rock or you've, I don't know, you moved a few rocks around the garden with your kids um, whenever you're planting trees or trying to stop them kicking the ball to ruin your plants. Have you ever picked up a rock and told it to start walking? Of course not. In fact, it's, it's, it sounds silly for me to even say that, that you can speak to a rock and it can just start walking. That's how scripture describes our hearts lifeless, without hope in this world, unable to change ourselves. That's what we're like outside of God's kindness to us in Jesus. Maybe that's you this morning if you're not a Christian here. Maybe you don't trust in Jesus this morning. It's so good that you're here and please keep coming and please keep coming. But by nature you reject the sower's word. Are you rejecting the sower's word outright like the shallow soil who couldn't care less? Or maybe you're someone who's had an interest in the past and who thought, okay, the gospel sounds good or it sounds plausible. But the worries of life and difficult circumstances have just caused the seed to fall on rocky ground and not produce fruit and not take root. Or maybe it's the cares of this world. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's fame, reputation. Maybe it's just having a comfortable life. And that has choked the word that you hear. Friends, we have to understand this morning our need of Jesus Christ. That because our hearts are hard, because our hearts naturally reject God who literally made us, who gives us the breath we are breathing right now, who's given us so much, that we actually deserve his anger, not his love. We must understand our need, our need to be reconciled to this God. But the word of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom is that God has made provision for that and sufficient provision. He's given us Jesus, the king of God's kingdom to live for us while we have him, to die savingly on a cross in our place, and to rise savingly three days later. He saves from the misery of our sin. Sin's awful. It generally makes life miserable. Sin also has consequences forever. But Jesus has come, and for all who rest on him by faith, they're forgiven of their sin, reconciled to God, and brought into this kingdom, which is a kingdom of light, and joy in spite of the difficult circumstances of life that we all face. You and I can hear the words of Jesus this morning, the one who speaks this parable, who says, come to me and I will give you rest. And he will gladly do that as we rest on him by faith. The word of the kingdom will be rejected as the word goes out. The method is there, it is clear. 
but the madness and the misery of rejecting that word is also clear. But the parable of sower gives you and I hope that the word of the kingdom will be accepted and it will produce fruit that it's appointed to do. Because we read in verse 8 and verse 23 that the seed also fell on good soil or fell on good soil and it produced fruit. It's implied that this is the one who hears and understands. They hear the gospel, but they also get it. They understand its implications for their lives and they gladly trust the Savior they hear in this message of the kingdom. They receive the forgiveness of their sin. They know life with Christ as they were meant to. Their hearts have become uncalloused. Their hearts have become livened and quickened to believe on Jesus, to turn from their sin, to confess their need. Such is the hardness of our hearts, but such is the power of God through his gospel that he can overcome our dead hearts. I told you about one friend from school. Let me tell you about another. Uh, We'll call him John. John's not his real name, so don't go looking him up later. John grew up in a church where he was confirmed. That will give you an indication of what kind of church he grew up in, if he was confirmed somewhere. Uh, He went to Christian summer camps. He learned all about Jesus growing up. But he never accepted what he heard. He never truly heard, nor he never truly understood. And therefore, he never trusted. John was a big rugby player. He got heavily involved in that scene and all that comes with it. He had trouble with girls. He was what you might call typical lads lad. I was friendly enough with him throughout school. I kept meeting up with him after school just to see how he was doing and also to try and hammer the gospel home to him. But he just didn't get it. I'm sure you can think of someone who just doesn't understand this or is just not going in. He was content doing life his way. That was until about five years ago, which is scary to think this was five years ago, but... Uh, One Sunday in October, I can't even remember the date, but it was sometime in October, uh, I turned up at uh, at the evening service of the church I was working in at the time, and there comes John walking in the door. I'd invited John many times to come to church. He'd obviously never come, but there he was. In fact, I came in the door, and he was already sitting down in a pew. I asked him, what are you doing here? In disbelief more than anything. And he said he wanted to come to church because he had become a Christian. All those times, not just through me, but through others, that he had heard about Jesus, he had heard the gospel, he had heard of his need of forgiveness, he had heard of the life that he needs in Christ. It just suddenly clicked when he was out on a walk one day. He was thinking about it all. And it just, like a light bulb came on. That was about five years ago and... Praise the Lord, John's still growing in the faith. He's still going on with Jesus. The word of the kingdom was accepted. And it it is producing fruit. You can think of other people just like John, I'm sure. In fact, you can maybe even think of your own life. That's the reality. That's what God's word does. The word of the kingdom will be accepted and it will produce fruit. How is it possible Well, we're kind of going back to the start. It's like a circular sermon here. It's only possible by God's word, by the sower's seed. If it's the means and the method, it's the only, it's what actually opens our eyes. It softens our hearts and unstops our deaf ears. The old Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, used to put it, that God speaks from his throne and makes even the deaf hear and those who are unwilling to acknowledge him to hear his voice. When God speaks, he is powerful enough to raise the spiritually dead to life and he's powerful enough to overcome our hard, unbelieving hearts. If you're a Christian this morning, that's what's happened to you. Rejoice, give thanks. Because it wasn't you that mustered up the faith to believe. It wasn't you that worked your way into his kingdom. How kind is the Lord in saving people who don't deserve it? And what does that mean then for us? Well, can I say that should give us real encouragement this morning? We have real and certain hope that as we faithfully sow the word, both here in church, through personal evangelism outside of this place, through various ministries you guys are involved in, 
We can be absolutely certain that as God's word goes out, that he is committed to growing his kingdom and people will accept that word. People will become citizens of this new kingdom. We are certain because God's word is enough to do his work. Maybe you grow disheartened. Maybe you are disheartened at the moment because maybe you look around this church or maybe a church you grew up in or churches around the place or denominations across our island or in the world and you just think that's not what it used to be like. Pews used to be filled. Maybe you see declining numbers across traditionally strong denominations on this island. Maybe you see a sea change in the morality of society and the ethics um, that it seems to portray. And maybe you're rightly discouraged. That's fair. It's hard to see that. But the parable of the sower reminds us not to lose heart. God is growing his kingdom by means of his word. And though some reject it, many will hear, understand, and trust the Savior they find in that word. And it will produce fruitfulness. A fruitfulness, the parable says, is of large and varying proportions. A hundredfold, 30, 60. Fruit is produced. It's easy to be cynical. But there's plenty going on, even in this denomination, that is to be thankful for. That God is growing his kingdom. God is still growing it. And he's growing faithful people into being fruitful people. And he does it through his hard heart smashing and softening word. Let that encourage us to trust the sewer, to trust his method when we don't think it works, and also to sow faithfully. And as we hear this word time and time again, let me go back to where we began. As we leave this morning, as you hear this parable, do you hear it? Do you understand it? Do you understand the gravity of what Christ has said in it? Are we truly hearing the word of this kingdom? Are we truly understanding? And are we truly trusting? If you have ears, let them be open and let you hear what Christ says to us. Let's pray together. Father, we humbly acknowledge that your word is good, even when we don't think it is. Father, we give thanks that your word is powerful, overcoming our dead and rebellious hearts. Even now, having come to faith, thank you that your word can overcome our hearts. Father, thank you for the saviour we find in your word who is enough for us to be reconciled to you, to be brought into the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, thank you that you have promised to build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Father, thank you for this tangible um, expression, this tangible reality that your word does your work. That we can trust it. Father, help us so faithfully as you so faithfully your word in this world, in our hearts, in this church and in this land. Father, we thank you for your word. And might it produce fruit in our hearts, in this church, in this land, across this world, so that many would confess Christ as saviour for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, as we've heard God's word, let's respond in the most appropriate ways possible by praising him and confessing with our mouths that Jesus alone is our hope in life and in death. Let's stand together and sing praise to God.
To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 